Hello and welcome to The Shift, the podcast that aims to tell the no-holds-barred truth about being a woman post-40. Created and hosted by me, journalist and author, Sam Baker. My guest today is the Jamaican author, journalist, filmmaker and living legend, Barbara Blake Hanna. Already an experienced journalist when she arrived in London in 1964, Barbara was shocked to discover her achievements counted for nothing because of the colour of her skin. But she made headlines anyway in 1968 when she became the first black TV journalist in the UK. Without Barbara, arguably, there would have been no Moira Stewart, no Trevor MacDonald. Now 80, Barbara has led a pioneering life, so it's a joy to celebrate it with the republication of her groundbreaking 1982 memoir, Growing Out, Black Hair and Black Pride in the Swinging 60s, as part of Bernadine Evaristo's Black Britain Writing Back series. She is someone I admire so greatly as a a black woman and as a writer. I've now had the privilege of reading all her books and I am just astonished at her literary talent and her black consciousness. Um, It's so wonderful. From her home in Kingston, Jamaica, which she shares with her son, Barbara told me what she learned from being at the sharp end of racism, feeling new again at 80, and how she learned to love herself as a black woman. Plus, she introduces me to my new mantra, time is longer than rope. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm not too bad. I've got long COVID, so it's such a pain. Did yeah. you want to find some golden seal? No, I didn't, but I'm going to get some on the internet. It's very good to flush your system. I mean, if I have a headache or feel I'm getting the flu, I'll drink three cups of tea in the day and by the end of the day, it's gone. It's the only thing I could recommend now for your long COVID. Health food store would probably have the powder. That's how I usually have it. But the capsules, you can just open a capsule and drop that in some hot water and make yourself tea. What's in it? It's a root, golden seal root, and they just powder it. It's like turmeric or any of those, you know. It's just a healthy thing to have. Jamaicans, we're very organic in our health. We go there first, and when nothing works, then we go to the doctor or use pills or whatever, you know. So golden seal, we always have. Turmeric, we always have. Ginger, raw ginger. Those three things are very essential. I had COVID briefly. I didn't have a very bad attack of it, but golden seal, turmeric, you know, throughout the day, teas. So I can tell you, try and get yourself some, darling. It's been going on four months now and it's like, wow, wow enough, wow. you know, enough. Wow. We're really fortunate because I'm definitely over it. My son, you know, the after effects lasted him a long while, but we're both totally over it. Try and get yourself some golden seal. Every leaf has a medical purpose. Yeah. Every one. <laughs> <laughs> They're now just discovering the efficacy of cannabis CBD oil. Yeah. And here we are in Jamaica where we use ganja every day. Maybe, <laughs> you know, why we're in good condition now. You know? yeah. <laughs> this is why you've recovered from COVID and I haven't. That's what it is. Oh, that could be why, you know. <laughs> it's not legal in England yet, is it? I don't yeah, know. you can get CBD oil and things in health food shops now. It's worth the expense, darling. Two drops at night, it really is worth the expense. You're now, a good advert for it. Yeah, your body needs it. You have CBD receptors. Your body wants it, darling. Your body wants it. Listen to me. Look at me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be 81 years old in two months' time. And things like that that I've been doing all my life life you know i think you are the unwrinkliest grown-up i've ever seen <laughs> you never had anything done or no nothing? no first of all i don't use makeup well i put some powder on my face but i don't use makeup so i've not been you know pulling my skin to wipe off eyeshadow and that sort of thing since i was maybe 30 i haven't been using makeup you know what i mean maybe i use some olive oil if my face looks dry revlon would go out of business if everybody was me and yeah, then- that's true Another thing is I smile. I think smiling a lot keeps your your face, the wrinkles from from growing in. You know what I mean? (laughs) So, and then, as I say, to use ganja, you know, virtually every day of my life. I've stopped smoking for some time now, but 
I find other ways to take it into my body because they say your body needs those receptors. The receptors want to be massaged and connected with. So we've been doing that all our lives, smoking this illegal thing. <laughs> we say ganja is for the healing of the nation. And now they've discovered it is a medicine. It is for healing. So Rasta say, yeah, we've been telling you this for so long, you know, <laughs> you listen to us, you know. <laughs> Oh, here we are. You're my new guru. Now, your program is for ladies 40 and over. I mean, I'm twice that age now. I had my son when I was 45. Did you? Yeah. And I breastfed for several years. So I oh. see that my body regenerated itself. Where does milk come from in your body all of a sudden? Good question. I say my baby brought it. My baby being in my body made it start producing milk. And it started functioning. So... I didn't stop after three months, as some people do. I just let it go on doing that, and the body just kept regenerating itself. So the longer I breastfed, the longer the body got a chance to refresh itself. Those are the only reasons I can see why, at this age, I'm still hale and hearty and in such good nick, you know what I mean? You really are. I wouldn't be that rude, but you really are in good nick. <laughs> so if you had your son at 45, I, we will talk about the book in a minute, but this is really interesting. And you were breastfeeding for a few years. What happened with menopause? I mean, my period was, was virtually gone, but I'd been praying for nine years for a child. I wouldn't say I'm religious, but as a Rasta, I am. I mean, the Bible says, if you have faith like a mustard seed, I will grant, you know, what you ask. So have faith. So I kept for nine years, I kept saying, I call God Ja. I kept saying, Ja, Ja, I haven't forgotten you, you know. Don't forget <laughs> me. Yeah, I'm still here. I'm still asking. And after nine years, there was a prayer, an Ethiopian prayer someone gave me. And I sat down one day and read it all the way through. And it said, there's a certain point, anoint yourself. And so I did and asked for what you want. I said, yes, son. And within a month, I was having funny tummy pains, went to the doctor. He did a test. He came out and he said, Barbara, it's a miracle. Call one of his names, John. That was what my doctor said to me. So there I was, you know, with a son at 45. And I don't know, miracles occur. And that's certainly a miracle. I call him a miracle child. You know, it's proof to me that, that faith works, that prayer works. And, you know, all those cliches, you know, that's my liberty. That's what Rastafari teaches me to believe and to do. And that if you live according to the instructions, you know, the Bible mm. is a handbook. Yeah, you know, check it out. See if it really works. Why not? You know, it does work and has worked. Here I am sitting in front of you. I'll be 81 in June. <laughs> Joel, if I look like you when I'm 81, or in fact, when I'm 71, I'll be very, very happy. As soon as we yeah. get off, I'm heading to the health food shop. You came to the UK when you were 20, didn't you? Could you have envisaged future you? This is what future Barbara would have looked like when you were young. Um, not in, in looks. In the months before I actually left England, I was then living in a one-room loft just off Oxford Street, but I was very depressed there. And I remember thinking, is this what my life is going to be like when I'm 60? An old lady in this, you know, old loft all by myself. And I didn't want that as a life. I didn't know what else life could be, but I didn't want that to be my life. I'd done a program for BBC Man Alive on old age pensioners. And in the research going around trying to find the right people to interview, I got a good look at what life was like for old people in Britain. And I didn't want that. I didn't want that. And I think, you know, therefore, when the opportunity came to return to Jamaica, I jumped at it because not that the health service is any better. It's so much worse in Jamaica. But for some reason, I didn't want that to be my life. An old lady in, a, in some national housing flat, maybe hundreds of stories up in the sky. I didn't want that in the winter, you know, all of that. I didn't want that. But in terms of looks, you know, I had no idea. I don't have any real vanity about how I look or I'd never had this thing about being pretty. My mother, who I didn't grow with, my mother was very very, very beautiful. My mother looked like Lena Horne. You know, she was a pale-skinned beauty with 
so-called pretty hair, but I didn't grow with her. Always, I guess, could say, well, I'm not as pretty as she is. So if anything, I had that as a, as a yardstick. But pretty was, you know, pale skin, thin nose and straight hair. And I wasn't any of that. So I never, ever saw myself as pretty. Therefore, you know, the counterbalance to that was you had to have a brain, you had to be intelligent. That was more important to me, to be intelligent. So as I say, I didn't have any vanity. Now I look back at pictures of me at 20s, 30s. I'm like, what? You were that pretty? Good heavens. Yeah, stunning. <laughs> Frankly, I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> By the yardstick of the times, I wasn't. I mean, Elizabeth Taylor, Anita Ekberg, you know, these were the beauties. Marilyn Monroe, I wasn't any of those. You know, Angela Davis was my heroine. And mm. that's what it encouraged me to grow my natural hair out because, yes, I could have that hairstyle. But pretty, you know, that wasn't <laughs> in my adjective describing myself. So it's basically basically a white definition of beauty mm. wherever you were. Until yeah. Black is Beautiful came along and I was able then to think about how I within myself could express that. First by seeing whatever I looked like as beautiful, accepting that. I mean, the hair that we've been taught wasn't quote unquote pretty. Deal with that. Grow it out anyhow. See how you look. And lo and behold, growing it out, I discovered I had this pretty hair. By the time I'd grown it out for several years, I discovered I could set it on rollers and it would fall into nice curls or even be quite straight. I didn't know. We didn't know. We'd always been told, straighten it, straighten it. And to discover that in its natural state, it was itself beautiful. And then to grow my dreadlocks. And I mean, my dreadlocks are really long. They're down to my ankles now. Yeah, they're all um, yeah. they're all wrapped up. Now I'll just hang them down and plait them. My plait is quite long. Oh, gosh. <laughs> this is such a shame that this is not video. But it's like Barbara's like waved this great big <laughs> lasso of, of dreadlocks at me. It's... Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Um, that, that was another beauty in itself as it grew and grew longer, you know. We always, when we were young, wanted to have hair that we could flash like the white girls. <laughs> You've got that now. You had the locks, you know, you could flick <laughs> them. You could put them up in a ponytail. You could hang them over your shoulder. So we had another level of beauty that was totally different to white beauty. You know, girls like, like Halle Berry came along and showed us another stage of beauty, you know, that the brown skin was beautiful. I mean, we'd had Eartha Kitt before and even say Dorothy Dandridge. The whole business of beauty evolved from the 60s, from that whole black is beautiful bridge that we jumped over with our hair, thanks to Angela, whose birthday we were celebrating yesterday. So was Angela Davis the first woman who gave you an idea of what was beautiful for a black woman? Exactly. And not only her face and hair, but what was going on in her head, the mm -hmm. whole attitude of pride in being black, black history, not just contemporary history of slavery, but black history way going way, 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 way back. We had been told that Egypt was white people like Elizabeth Taylor and Cleopatra. We thought Egypt was white, was European people. The more that Egypt that's revealed, the more we see the Africanness, the features, everything. That In fact, the Sphinx's nose was shot off because it was so African. To see Tutankhamun's um, face mask and see very African features of his nose and mouth and his cheekbones, even though the mask was gold. You could see this was the mask of an African man. So more and more we could see the beauty of ourselves as more of that history, the layers like an onion skin were peeled off. So the 60s was a watershed for us. It was a time when Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, the battle for independence from colonial rule all over Africa, all those things were happening in the 60s. And we were accompanied by the white people who were fighting against the war in Vietnam, the white people who were saying, make love, not war, that whole, you know, beat mm music revolution that was happening where there was no racism in the Beatles, in that culture. There was no racism. It was 
make love. It was love. The Beatles went to India and got their spiritual consciousness among another race of people, another culture. So the 60s was a great melting pot for the world. And we're there again now with Black Lives Matter. It's like a replay. I don't know what to call what happened to George Floyd, but the George Floyd murder. So many words you could call what happened there. They, they say it was a lynching. That's the word. But it, the international revolution Revolution that came about because of his murder has been another catalyst, melting pot for our own attitudes towards ourselves. You know, it's like the battle isn't over, fight it again, but there are newer weapons. I mean, the George Floyd move Floyd movement around the world was multiracial. Tears fell down my face when I saw the crowds gathered in Trafalgar Square. Everybody was there, every color all mixed together, one attitude in their minds, you know. There's a picture of the black man who has rescued a white man who's about to be beaten up, lifted and carried out of the crowd. And he says, you know, I was there to fight against them, but I couldn't just let him die. I had to. I mean, the humanity within him, you know, moved him. So we're there again with better weapons. We've got communication now. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have this one-on-one -on -one like you and I are having right now. So it's being fought again, that battle. I'm glad to say. It hasn't stopped being fought, you know. It's just new weapons and new warriors have come to the battlefield. Do you feel optimistic about the way that young people are kind of driving the Black Lives Matter movement forward and the way you see young women, young men as well, but young women standing their ground and yes. using young their voices? Women especially. Because, you know, people tend to put down women, you know, we're supposed to be second. But out of us comes life. We make children. And, you know, when the union of two people doesn't work, we get left with it, the baby. I mean, mm -hmm. my mother and father divorced and my father fought very hard to get custody of my sister and myself. So I was brought up by a man, which is really unusual then and even now. But usually we women have to do the bringing up. And therefore, the, the responsibility women have in life is so important. And we take that responsibility all the time. When you see the demonstrations and see women being strong, leading, standing on the platforms, look at climate change. It's a young woman who is leading that. It's young women. It's the females of the world. Because we say, I'm going to have a child to bring up in all of this. I am going to... Mm -hmm responsible for feeding that child, for carrying that child till it's big enough to walk by itself. I'm responsible for teaching it how not to get killed crossing the road, simple things like that. So we women really have a greater responsibility in the world than men do. We certainly take a greater responsibility, yeah. Yes, yes. And I'm so glad to see the young people generally but especially the young women not being content to stand in the kitchen and over the washing machine, but being out there leading the revolutions. There's another stunning photograph of a young Black Lives Matter girl way at the start of that revolution. And she's facing a lineup of, of masked soldiers with their guns pointed. And she's just moving forward to them. Does she have a mm. book in her hand? or something like that. And she, it's a woman. It's a woman, you know? The Angela Davises of today that stand on the platforms. I mean, women like Michelle Obama. The examples that we have today are more of females. In Barbados, the new prime minister has made her country a republic. And then she's appointed a woman as the president and a woman as her vice prime minister, deputy prime minister. So there's three women. I'm so proud woman power it is our time it always has been it always has been we tend to just be women we take that mothering role very seriously and i think that's good i think it's it's long overdue for more women to be leaders people put down um kamala harris in america vice president mm. and think she's not doing anything but she is i mean you don't have to be jumping up and down to be doing things you know she's yeah. just quietly getting on with the job exactly sometimes just being able to do that is the 
past it, you know. My job is in the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport. And the minister is a woman and a very excellent woman leader. I met her first in the 80s when I was appointed an independent senator. She was the government side as senator in charge of culture. That's the 80s. From then till now, I mean, she's still the leading government person for culture. And she has entertainment. She grew up in the entertainment industry, one would say. She has gender. She has women's affairs. And she's concentrating very heavily on providing sanctuaries for victims of domestic violence. And she's also responsible for young girls who get pregnant at school age. And gender also includes men. But of course, she concentrates on women's issues. And then sport. I mean, our leading sports person was Usain Bolt. But now yeah. is a woman, Elaine, um, Elaine Herrera. I, I don't remember her. Thompson. Elaine Thompson Herrera. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Barbara's son. <laughs> <laughs> you can hear him. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> she is our sports heroine now. So it's woman time. It's long overdue for it to be woman time. And we're doing it and we're doing it very well as well. Yeah. And you say in your book that you were brought up to be a black English woman. Could you have envisaged, you know, the way that women have begun to get more powerful jobs, you know, running more countries when you were being brought up in a very different way to how you've decided to live your life? No, I mean, I really was brought up to be a black English woman. And that's all we were supposed to try to be. Our education, everything was teaching us to be English because we We were an English colony. As I told you, I was brought up by a man, by my father. And I realized how much he taught me to be a strong woman. I wouldn't say as strong as a man, but yes. For example, our neighborhood was right on the shore, Kingston Harbor. And there was a big pool there. We would go swimming there every day. But every Sunday, he would take us out to the beach. And we could swim. We could swim. So he would swim way out. He would swim far out. And he would make us come with him. And then when we got far out, he would make us swim back alone. And I realized in retrospect how much that taught me. It gave me strength. It gave me courage in myself. And it also taught me that there is a point at which no matter what, there is safety at the end. No matter what you have to go through, no matter how hard you have to swim, if the sea is rough and you're swimming through rough water, there's a point at which the waves are going to drop you right on the shore and you'll be okay. You might be a bit battered from, you know, the gravel hitting your knees, but you're okay. I look back at that and I say, yes, daddy was teaching me something really important. At 15, my sister and I swam across the harbor race. She was a year younger, but stronger in body. But I swam across Kingston Harbor. And I mean, I remember once, you know, doing my breaststroke, I hit something that felt like a concrete wall. And I realized that was a big fish. You know, at that point, I said, come on, daddy, take me out of the water. And he was <laughs> near my yeah. I, near the shore, I got out, you know, I let my sister finish because the race was all so that she could finish and try to win. She came second. But to swim across Kingston Harbor at 15 teaches you another strength. So I was brought up to be a strong person, but I was brought up to be a, an English woman. I mean, history of myself as Africa was just the place we came from as slaves. And my history as a Jamaican began with slavery. I didn't know anything else. And it took the 60s and the revelations that have now unfolded to become a, a Rasta in the 70s. That was my university. That was my African university. There I began acquiring a, a, a vast volume of, of African knowledge and history that hasn't ended. My education isn't over. I have a PhD in African history, you know, and more. What comes after PhD? Maybe a double PhD is coming. (laughs) (laughs) Who knows? So there are those layers that manage to cover over that English education I'd received. And I'm glad that it happened. I'm glad I had that basis of knowledge because it gave me a knowledge of the world with England as its base, yes, but a foundation from which to search for more. You know what I mean?
I learned about art, the great artists of the world. I had access to literature, the great writers of the world. All of that kind of education was a very good foundation for me, even though underneath it all was this, but you're inferior because you're black, because you're not Mm -hmm. because you're not European. You're a second-class citizen. It would always teach me, you know. Um, I'm so glad to have eliminated that from my knowledge, from my being. You know, the whole world now, maybe they, they don't live it, but we know we're not inferior. Maybe the way we're treated is inferior, but we know we're not. We know our history now. When they rolled coast and statue down into Bristol Harbour, we sat and applauded because we'd never heard of him before, you know. I'd never heard no, of him before. No, I'd never heard of him. But I looked him up and discovered there was something called the Royal African Company, which was headed by the royal family of the time, and that he was the largest exporter of slaves. What? And that the whole of Bristol was made wealthy by his wealth from enslaving my ancestors. What? Why? Those four kids who got arrested for mm -hmm. holding the statue, those are heroes. Those are heroes. Those are four young people I would like to meet. Four young white people I would like to meet. They said they did it because it had to be done. That the statue being there was an insult to people they knew. I can't believe that four little white kids did that. That's so beautiful. I'm sure if you get here, they'd like to meet you. Or they'd probably like to come to you, actually. Oh, wow. <laughs> what a day that would be. What a conversation we would have. Gee whiz. Because I don't know my ancestors. I know my father. I never met his father, although every Emancipation Day he would drive us down to James Hill, the little country village where he had been born and where his father had been born. His father had been born just as slavery ended. So his grandfather was a slave. And I mean, who are these people? I don't know any of them. You know, who were they? There's no way I can track them down. Why? What was the pain of it all? The anger that I have to suppress. You see, I can't even find words to talk to you about, mm. darling, because it's just so awful. When you read about what slavery was like, what slaves had to endure, the enslaved people, because we weren't slaves, we were enslaved Africans. Some of the, the things are so awful, I can't describe them to you. I don't want those words to come out of my mouth. So I have to put down the anger because I don't want wrinkles. I want to be all yeah. smile, you know. I don't want furrows in my forehead because it makes you angry. So those four little kids who roll that statue down to the harbor, oh boy, they make me so happy. Tears roll down my face, tears oh. of joy. Oh, I was just so happy. I could see George Floyd clapping. I could see my ancestors clapping. Every, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you look so happy. Yes, yes. The world must change. One day someone's going to apologize for slavery. Apologize big, big, because there's so many millions of people to whom that apology must be directed. The spirits of our ancestors are here listening and waiting for that to happen. It must come. Those four little children apologize. They're children. They're my grandchildren. At my age, they could be great-grandchildren. Got to give them thanks. You were in the UK for, was it eight, nine years? From 64 to 72? Yes. What was your experience back then? Well... I came to England knowing that I was this, you know, second class person, but I didn't realize what racism was really like and experiencing it each day, a new layer, a new experience was a revelation. I think if I hadn't been the person I was, I mean, I knew who I was. As I said, my father brought me up with that strength and we had lived a sort of upper middle class life. It sent us to the best school in the Caribbean, a school where only the wealthy from the Caribbean islands were sent. And we lived the kind of life where I had a nursemaid, we had a housekeeper, we had a cook, we had a gardener. So I lived that kind of life. I didn't live a ghetto life. I wasn't mm. So I had a, a sense of myself. 
I'd done things in Jamaica that also gave me a sense of myself. I'd been in the pantomime, I wrote articles, I broadcast on the radio and TV. But to discover that all of that meant nothing in England, really, because of the color of my skin, was something I had to get used to coping with. And I think politeness and diplomacy is what got me through a lot of that, until I, I made a few friends and was able to have them as a buffer between that and what I hoped should be, you know? Mm. I lived in Ladbroke Grove a lot of the time. I had a nice flat for several years in Chepstow Road, long before it was gentrified. I was in England a few years ago. I couldn't believe um, how nothing in Gate has become so upper class. It's dead posh now. Oh yeah. my gosh, I mean, <laughs> it was definitely the ghetto when I lived there. Um, and that was a, a cushion as well, you know, because there was Portobello Road and you could buy patties on one end and green bananas and at the other end I used to love um, vintage clothing I used to love those second hand dresses cut on the bias in those lovely fabrics that was two sides of life right there around me there were white people living on one side and black people on the other side and you know crazy people across the road yeah you know, always the guy who worked with Mr. Fish Boutique lived on the corner life was very interesting and I liked that. I mean, we all young people who go abroad to see the world. We gain an education no matter what, you know. When you were in the UK and you became the first black TV journalist, could anything have prepared you for the reaction to that? No, of course not. I didn't know when I got the job that I was the first. I mean, it was just another job. You know, I'd been a journalist all my working life from mm. I was 17. And as I said, I'd done some TV in Jamaica. I'd even been hostess of a weekly quiz show. So, you know, on television every week, that was no big thing. I'd read the news. When I was working as the PR for Jamaica, I'd had two opportunities to be on television. One to talk about Jamaica and another time to answer questions. So to apply for a job as a journalist on this new television station, Station, thinking I would, you know, write news. And then to be invited to be an on-camera journalist, that was cool. That was no problem. It was just another step in my career as a journalist. When the media made a big thing of it the day after, it was on the front page of all the newspapers, except the Daily Express. Have of course. A reputation of never putting a black on the front page. But to be news all over the media was a big shock. And I was like, oh, wow. But in those days, there wasn't anything you could do about, you know, front page notoriety. You know, <laughs> we're like, oh, well, read the newspaper. What's tomorrow's newspaper? And I just went ahead and did my job. Maybe it opened the doors for me. I discover now that Jamaicans and black people all over London were so thrilled. They would be telling yeah. the children, hurry and come over from school so you can see this Jamaican woman on TV. And they themselves made it a point to get home from work in time to see me on television. Now they tell me, you know, years later yeah. I see them and they tell me. But I wish they had known that if they had written letters to the paper saying how much they appreciate loved that, maybe I would still have the job, you know. Alan Harvey's went on for 18 years, I think, or 12 years in the same and job. And he was recruited at the same time in as you. Time, yeah? Yes, there were three of us who got the job. Mine was the only contract that wasn't renewed because there were all these people saying, I mean, the N word, I'm not allowed to say it, but it's such a terrible word. Yeah. It's such a terrible word that people would actually call in and write in saying. And would write that. Yes. And that was the year in which the British Parliament passed the Race Relations Act that said discrimination against people for their color, race, ethnic origin was now illegal in jobs, in housing, in everything. That was the same year the bill was passed. I went to Parliament for one of the readings, and Thames Television could have said to these racists, no, we're not going to fire her. There's a law now that says we shouldn't. And moreover, we don't agree that her color is an offense, else we wouldn't have hired her. 
But they didn't say that. They said, okay, racists, we agree with you. We will please you. We will do what you want. That's just the most shocking thing of all. At that point, you had no recourse through the Race Relations Act. No, no. I mean, there was no organization I could appeal to, to say, you know, please champion my cause. There was no movement to say she must not be fired. There was just me, you know, another black person fired for being black. There were so many of us all yeah. over losing their jobs for that reason. So I was just another. So I just tiptoed quietly away, went back to my little lab grove flat and back to the temporary secretarial work till my agent found me another job, this one in Birmingham, doing the same thing and in fact suffering even more racism there, you know, till I realized, boy, this ain't never going to stop, you know. These people just hate you for being black. And nobody was teaching those people <laughs> the reason why I was there. Um, and nobody's teaching the history. Um, Bernadine Everisto, her autobiography, her manifesto, she writes about the fact that her brother was so hurt at being made to read the book Little Black Sambo in school. Oh. I cannot believe they really did that. Little Black Sambo in school and made little black children read it. I can't believe. So I can believe it. Yeah. It's time for a leveling. It's time for more like what those four little white children did. There's more of that. They showed that they know the, the history. They know their history. Everyone should. Who taught them? How did they know? From touching up with black people, they heard their history. They didn't learn it in school. No, no way. They learned it on the television or the radio. It was absorbed into their system. It needs to go up higher than that. Yeah, much higher. Yeah. Yeah. And how did you feel when you found out that Bernadine Evaristo wanted to republish your book? <laughs> oh, wow. That was one of the greatest bits of news of my life. I think it's second only to having a, a press award named after me, after my experience. That's brilliant. That was launched in 2020 at yeah, yes. the Barbara Blake Hanner Award. Yes. I mean, to meet her, well, digitally, not in person yet, but she is someone I admire so greatly as a, a Black woman and as a writer. I've now had the privilege of reading all her books and I am just astonished at her literary talent and her Black consciousness. Um, it's so wonderful. One of her books, um, Black Roots, I think, is the title of that one, where she turns the whole slavery experience around and the slaves are all white people and the slave owners are all black. That's such a funny book and such a true book, looking at slavery from what if it had been black people enslaving white people? What would that be like? She's just always completely stuck to her guns yeah. and done her thing regardless of what and was what going on around nice. her. I mean, having her publish my book, she took the fame and the influence that she had from winning the Booker Prize and put it to use for others. She shared that greatness with others. She shared that with me, bringing my book forward, making my experience be shared. She has shared what she has. I mean, we all could sit down and just be, oh, thanks. Thanks for the money. Let me write for the book and get more famous. She didn't do that. She's reached out in so many ways to Black people and Black authors. I can't thank her enough. I can't thank her enough. It's given me a new life. You know, at age 80, I'm, I'm, I'm new again, you know. <laughs> Who would have thought? Who would have thought? <laughs> I can't envisage you ever stopping, actually. No, I don't. I keep writing. I have two more books because that was growing out. I've now written growing up because coming back to Jamaica, I grew up. I mean, that was getting to know my country all over again as a black woman because I left Jamaica as a black English woman, as a would-be white. But I came back home as a black woman and a Jamaican. I'm collecting a book of my short essays, past columns. I'm putting that together, mainly for the history. History must be put down, put together. And here I am, Barbara Blake. I've become somebody, Barbara Blake Hannah. It needs to be put down for the next generation to read about. Those experiences need to be shared. So I put those together in Growing Up, 
which is my next book. I'd actually put it up on Amazon, but I haven't um, publicized it much. So it is available on Amazon and people are reading it. But I'll speak more about it after the launch of Growing Out. I yes, yeah. Growing Out, you know, get its wings and fly. Yeah. And I just have to say, I listened to you read, as well as reading Growing Out myself, I listened to you read it. They sent me the audio files. Oh, wow. And it was it was absolutely wonderful because it was just brought this whole other world of 60s London and your experience of it to life. It's amazing. I couldn't recommend it more highly. Oh, it's absolutely nice. brilliant. I'm so glad to hear that you, you listened to it. We had fun. My son helped me. He did the recording in our home for four days and it was so much fun to read it and for him he says well mommy I really got to know so much about you it was nice to do it I think we've got some of his music in it as intros to some of the chapters yes yeah you have good. oh good oh good well that's yeah. great I'm very proud of the audiobook just before I ask you the questions I always ask at the end, I want to ask you a question because there's a phrase in Growing Out that you use that I absolutely loved. And I think it's a Jamaican phrase, time is longer than rope. Yes. It's a very Jamaican phrase. We use it to say everything is endless. Don't think that things are going to stop here. Time longer than rope. You didn't know in 1968 that the pain and suffering you had then 50 years later would make lemons into lemonade. Time is really longer than rope. You know, that's just what it means. Just wait, just wait. Time longer than rope, Barbara. Time longer yeah. than rope, yes. And it has been proven to be. Yes, yes. That's brilliant. <laughs> that phrase. <laughs> I love it. And it's so, and when you put it in context like that, it's like, yeah. Yes. I get yes. that. That's how we use Take it. it. That's how we use it. Parents will always say that to children, you know, I want to do this and I want to do that. No, no, no. Just you wait. Time longer than rope. <laughs> <laughs> right. What is your emotional age? Oh, I'm just a kid. I'm a teenager. I'm just a teenager. Um, you look like one. That skin, honestly. <laughs> I love you. I love you. You're so sweet, Sam. Thanks, darling. Well, I can't ever grow up because the Bible says you must be born again. And it means hold on to your child spirit. Be fresh and not destroyed by the world yet. Keep that simplicity, that optimistic way of looking at life. And I do. Every day I wake up and say, what good thing is going to happen to me today? I'm still that child, not waiting for Santa Claus, waiting for the miracle to drop because there are miracles we are promised and there's going to be one every day there's at least one miracle a day so my emotional age yes I'm still a teenager just coming into my 20s I think yes <laughs> <laughs> um could you recommend a book uh, either that you've read recently that you liked or one that's made a big impact on your life so many books have made an impact on my life the Home of All World Religions by Dr. Joseph ben Yochanan was a book that really taught me a lot. The Bible, of course. Bernadine Everista's book, Girl, Woman, Other, impressed me enormously. I really enjoyed reading that book. It showed me so much as an author and as a woman and just as a person. Uh, what advice would you give younger women? <laughs> Be a woman. And being a woman is not about finding some nice man to marry, finding some rich man, finding some handsome man. That's not about womanhood. It's about being yourself, being your full potential as female. To be a female is not, you know, how sexy I, I can look. How can I be Kim Kardashian? Ah, that's not woman. Womanhood is that mothering, mothering the world, mothering the world. You are, you are woman. And that's an important half of the world. Take it and take it to its fullest extent. Don't limit yourself in any way. Be woman, be woman. That's the advice I would give young women. Be woman. Um, who is your old bird role model? So an older woman who has inspired you? Una Morrison, journalist, first black woman on British radio in the 40s in the war time. Nanny of the Maroons, the warrior heroine. Angela Davis, Winnie Mandela, 
Angela Davis is, I don't think she's much older than me. Winnie Mandela probably around, would be about the same age if she was still alive. Those would be the women that I would, you know, stick their pictures on my wall. Yes, the female women of today. Yes. What's your superpower? My superpower is love. My superpower is love. Being able to love unconditionally, love the world, love people, love all people, to give love at all times. My superpower is love. Yeah, yeah. And lastly, how many fucks do you give? (laughs) I don't know what that means. I mean, how much do you care about all the noise in the world? (laughs) Oh, I care a lot. I do. I Oh, there's nothing I, I give an F for. Um, it all matters. It all matters. It all matters. It's all important because if it's not good, I want to be able to change it, no matter what it is. I care about it all. I care about it all. That's why my superpower is love, because I know that with love, I can change it all, no matter what. So, yes, I do. I do give an F. There's nothing I don't give an F for. <laughs> oh, Barbara, thank you so much. It's been such a joy talking to you. <laughs> I love speaking with you. It's such a joy to meet you, young lady. Not that young. <laughs> you are, you are. You're young to me. I love your questions. I love your conversation. That we'll do young. it again when the next book comes out. <laughs> Don't forget the golden seal, darling. Don't forget. I won't. When I've downloaded all these files, I'm heading straight out to the health food shop. (laughs) Anything that is going to give me potentially your forehead. Honestly, look, you can't even get those wrinkles. Look at my wrinkles. It's all about smiling a lot. It's all about smiling. (laughs) I love you. I love you. I send you much love. I send you much love. love. Right back to you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. You can hear a new episode of The Shift each Tuesday on Acast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you hear, please do rate, review, and follow, because it really does help other people find us. And if you'd like to know more about my own experience of shifting, my book, The Shift, How I Lost and Found Myself After 40, and You Can Too, is out now in paperback. See you next time. See you next time.